And finally, in the third part of the first lecture, I'll be talking about different versions of libertarianism and Franklin's theory in particular. So libertarianism is a difficult theory to defend because we have to do something that we might call climbing up and down incompatibilist mountain. So first, you need to show that free will is incompatible with determinism, so that compatibilism is false. That's climbing up incompatibilist mountain. But once you've done that, you have to come down again by showing that free will is actually compatible with indeterminism. And both tasks are very difficult, but presumably the even more difficult task is to show that free will is actually compatible with indeterminism because there are several well-known problems. And let's go over these problems very quickly. The first problem is one we've already touched on. It's called the problem of luck. And here the idea is simply that if indeterminism is true and indeterminism governs your, governs your decision such that, that it's a purely a matter of chance whether you are deciding to order raspberry ice cream or deciding to order vanilla ice cream, then it's very hard to see how your action could actually be free or up to you because it just seems to be a matter of luck how the chances work out and whether you do the one thing or the other thing. That's a problem of luck. The second related problem is the problem of enhanced control. And the problem of enhanced control arises as follows. So libertarians think that free will is incompatible with determinism. So they think that any agent whose decision is determined by prior circumstances thereby lacks the kind of control that is required to have free will. And libertarians also think that to have the control over one's actions that's required for free will, indeterminism must be true. But the problem then is that it seems intuitively that once you take away determinism and replace it with indeterminism, agents seem to have even less control over their actions. So if determinism is true, then your prior mental states might fully determine your actions. But if indeterminism is true, that's no longer true. Now, now it's still true that your prior mental states have some bearing on how you will act. But now in addition, chance comes in too. But chance is just another factor that's also not out under your control. So it seems now you have even less control over your action because it now not only depends on your prior mental states and circumstances, which you ultimately have no control over. It also depends on how chance processes work out that you also have no control over. So the problem of enhanced control is for libertarians to spell out how indeterminism can possibly give you a kind of control over your actions that you lack when determinism is true, given that on the face of it, indeterminism actually seems to take away control. And so the third and last problem, which Franklin calls a problem, but it's more a question than a problem. And it's simply the question of where exactly indeterminism needs to be located for an action to be free. Libertarians think that an action can only be free if indeterminism is true. But that leaves open at which place exactly indeterminism needs to come in. After all, performing an action is a very complex process that's drawn out over time. And there are, it involves several different stages in which chance could play a role. For example, a typical action involves first deliberation, where you consider your reasons, various reasons occur to you, and you try to weigh them against each other. Then based on the deliberation, you will form a basic action. And the basic action is usually something like forming a decision um, or an intention. And then we have the step from the basic actions, your decision to intention, to actually carrying out that intention and performing a non-basic action. And chance could come in at any of these places. It could be a matter of chance which reasons pop into your head during the process of deliberation. It could be a matter of chance once you've sorted out what reasons you have, which decision these reasons cause you to make. And it could be a matter of chance whether once you've formed a basic action, an intention or a decision, whether you actually go through with that, with that intention and perform a non-basic action. So libertarians 
need to make clear where exactly indeterminism needs to be located for the action to be free and how exactly indeterminism at that place contributes to the freedom of your action. So as you can see, libertarians have the work cut out for them. And libertarianism comes in three basic varieties. So agent causal libertarians and event causal libertarians agree that what makes an action free has to do with its causal history. However, they disagree about what this history needs to look like. Agent causal libertarians deny agency reductionism. And so they hold that free will requires basic causation by an irreducible agent, the kind of theory we've seen when we talked about Chisholm. Event causal libertarians, on the other hand, um, accept agency reductionism. And so they hold that a free action is caused purely by earlier events. So it involves the same kind of ordinary event causation that you also find everything else in the world. There's no special involvement by, um, by any kind of irreducible notion of an agent. And finally, non-causal libertarians hold that free will has nothing very much to do with how your, your action is caused. An action is free in virtue of someone belonging to you in a non-causal way. This position, however, is not very popular and is rarely discussed. And as you know by now, um, the version of libertarianism that Franklin um, focuses on is event causal libertarian, libertarianism since Franklin assumes that agency reductionism is true. Okay, so in the class we will also talk exclusive, exclusively about event causal libertarianism. But Franklin then points out that even if you are an event causal libertarian, you still have choices about what kind of libertarian you want to be. We can make further distinctions and that now has to do with how you solve the problem of location. You still um, have to make a choice about where indeterminism needs to come in for an action to be free. And so non-action-centered libertarians think that indeterminism has to come in in the process of deliberation. So for an action to be free, there needs to be indeterminism with regards to what actions, what reasons come to your mind when deliberating. Action-centered libertarians hold that indeterminism needs to come in in how your action is caused. But here Franklin points out that st this still leads to options. Indeterminism could come in in how your reasons cause your basic action, or it could come in in how your basic action causes non-basic actions. And so Franklin's own theory of libertarianism focuses on basic actions. So it requires indeterminism um, to be located here in the process by which your reasons cause your basic actions, your intentions, or your, in, or your decision. And just to note that, of course, Franklin can also allow that indeterminism is also located here and here. All kinds of processes might be indeterministic. But his theory is that as long as you have indeterminism here, that suffices to make your theory, your action free, given that other constraints are met. And what are these other constraints? Here's a brief overview of Franklin's position, which he will defend and which he calls minimal, minimal event causal libertarianism. I will not go into the details here, but just quickly talk through it. So it's called, it's called event causal libertarianism because it's just seen, it's a version of event causal libertarianism. And it's called minimal because it's a very, very simple theory compared to most other theories in the literature. So here's why the theory is minimal. So the first condition basically just requires that um, for his action to be free, the agent needs to be normatively competent with regard to the action in question. And that basically just means that the action, that the agent can evaluate whether the action is morally good or morally bad and can make reasonable decisions. For example, you may think that a cat is not normatively competent, and so when a cat kills a mouse, um, she's not mor morally responsible for the action because she has like no understanding that her action might be morally wrong. The second condition says that the action in question needs to be a basic action, and that has to do with what I just said in the, on the earlier slide, 
that Franklin thinks that indeterminism needs to be located in how reason costs basic actions. And then the other substantial assumptions in Franklin's theory are three and four, and three and four say that the action needs to be indeterministically caused by the agent's reason in a non-deviant way. And we saw what non-deviant causation means in um, the previous lecture, it just means caused in a normal way. And condition four just says that the causation is indeterministic. So it needs to be the case that even though your actual reasons are cause you to um, form basic action phi, that might also have caused a different basic action that's not phi. So that's it. It's really, compared to other theories of free will, a simple theory. And now the only other thing I want to do is explain to you the difference between directly free actions and indirectly free actions. And that's important because Franklin only gives an account of directly free actions. So here's the difference. So suppose a man gets really, really drunk in the morning and then he um, changes clothes, gets a haircut, and, that later, and then later that day, still really, really drunk, gets into a car and causes an accident. Now it seems that the agent is not directly free when he decides to get into the car. After all, at that point, he's already very, very drunk. And being, being very, very drunk, he plausibly is not normatively competent because he's not in a position to correctly evaluate what's right or wrong. But still, we think that the agent is morally responsible for the accident because he freely decided back here when he still was normatively competent to, to get drunk, which then caused him to get into the car and caused the accident. And so we want to say that even, a, even if an agent is not directly free, he's indirectly free if his decision traces back to a directly free action. And it's a difficult question how exactly an action needs to be related to a directly free action in order to count as indirectly free. But it's something that Franklin simply wants to set aside and say for another day. He only wants to give a, provide a theory of what makes an action directly free. And actually, almost all theories in the literature about free will are theories of directly free action. So there's nothing, nothing particular going on about Franklin's theory here. Thank you for bearing with me. I know it was a lot to take in, a lot of detail, a lot of groundwork. But now that we have some grasp of the basics, we can dive into the specifics of Franklin's theory starting next week. And I'll talk to you soon. Bye.